Hello, friends. I'm Brian Shercliffe with Vitality. And uh, you might not know, but we have a little group that meets every now and then at Vitality called Birthing a New Age. And uh, it's a rather interesting group. We just get together and tell stories and talk and kind of wonder about, it just seems, I don't know, maybe you noticed too, that it seems like there's been a lot of change in the air and uh, maybe even so much change all at once that makes you kind of wonder, ah, maybe we're on some threshold moment, some important moment uh, of a new time being birthed. And if you study history, you notice that it seems to happen in um, kind of every 500 years. And not surprisingly, uh, the last time something new was being born, there was also a pandemic. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So we have this group that gathers and we share ideas and kind of um, talk about the changes in our own lives and our own heart's desires. And it's been a lot of fun. And for me, you know, often uh, in the work that I do, it's been interesting to also uh, look backward uh, through time and begin to notice that there in each of these ages, there's been this, I don't know, an idea that keeps trying to be born, <clears throat> keeps trying to be born, but it keeps getting smashed down. And I wonder if our time, it might finally be born and uh, permeate the entire planet. I wonder if this is the time, could it be? And what is that idea? Well, you know, I begin to wonder too, if the assumptions that I have begin to prevent me from even noticing this idea in my life as I read about it, kind of swimming through all these ancient traditions. And what idea is that? It's that we are equally valued, that human beings, each life is worth something, is, is worth something equal to the other. Rather wild idea, right? That all humans are equal. And, you know, today we hear the the wonderings about, uh, oh gosh, we need to get rid of patriarchy. Yeah, okay, I agree. And oh gosh, you know, the, the harms of the slave owner mentality of uh, centuries past and maybe even how it's still being lived out today. Of course, that needs to go. You know, and all the LGBTQ hate, of course, that needs to go. But what is at the core of all of these terrible isms that have been plaguing human life on this planet, uh, not, just in the, not just during our lifetimes and not just a couple centuries ago, but for millennia. What is that idea? And you start to wonder and notice that it is the hierarchical imagination or the imagination that thinks that one person is better than another. And I don't know about you, but I notice that I play this game in almost every interaction uh, that I engage with, every relationship seems to be this, oh, is this person better than me or worse than me? Where do I fit in this pecking order, in this hierarchy? And perhaps that is the, the deep root that needs to be examined um, and wondered about and to see if we can choose something else, uh, to notice when we fall into that trap and see if we can choose something else. Um, I wonder about that. I mean, do you do that too? I mean, do you, every interaction kind of wonder, oh, is this person better or worse than me? Where do I fit? And how should I treat this person as a result? Instead of perhaps another way of beginning to relate to the person and beginning to realize that, ah, they breathe the same air as me. And ah, they're made of the same stuff as me and ah, huh, they live on this planet just like me. Huh, isn't that interesting that uh, this person could, that I'm engaging with in relationship could be equally valued? Can my imagination be open to that possibility that we are equally valued? And I've been fascinated for years that an old story that tried to remind people of this equal relationship um, seems to keep circling through us, but rarely uh, read in the way that the story was first told, or at least as we've, as we've received it anyway. And often our assumptions get splattered on top of the story that prevent us from noticing its wisdom. 
And this story that uh, many know that I love is the Eden story in Genesis. Uh, first told by what scholars name this person, J, almost definitely a woman. I'll explain that in just a second. In my writings, I've often playfully called her Sweet Lady J, um, just for fun. And most people don't even realize that when they're reading that story, first, that it's from a woman, second, that it was told just a story around a campfire, likely, and third, just how radical of a story it was. Because the stories before this storyteller's time, that we have anyway, from ancient Babylon, the stories that predate Sweet Lady J's stories, always have women either as sl sex slaves or as goddesses that clearly take their marching orders from a head god or are evil sea monsters that need to be destroyed because they chose their own marriage partner instead of listening to the men telling them who they should marry. So that's, those are the, that's the backdrop of the Eden story. It has, uh, those Babylonian stories do not present women as being heroes of the story. Rarely do they even have speaking roles. Rarely do they contribute something to the action of the story that is valuable to the plot. But in the Eden story, something different happens because a woman gives birth to knowing. A woman gives birth to knowing, to wisdom. Imagine that. All because she saw a lusty piece of fruit that she reached out and ate. Double entendre there, I think, double meaning there. And just like the snake, and it was just like the snake told her uh, that it would happen. It's interesting that the snake was right, yeah? That her eyes would be opened and she would be just like a god or goddess. Very interesting. What is this knowing? Well, in the ancient world, to know had multiple meanings. It certainly had to do with like, oh, I know how to get to this place. I know this, I know that. Uh, I know how to make this, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it also has to do with knowing another human being in every way, in, uh, even in, and including sexually. You know, for instance, a uh, husband and a wife would know each other is often the, the play on words and the stories as we'll soon see uh, in just a moment. And that's the key to understanding the Eden story. Um, and I invite you to begin to listen to this story again, perhaps for the first time, uh, as I've been listening carefully for at least 30 years uh, to this story alone in a very, um, trying to listen in a very slow, deep way. And what I do when I listen to this story is I, go back to the Hebrew text that we've received. And here is the text that I look at, right? And, you know, nowadays I've gotten better at reading this and I could read this, you know, pretty quickly. I might look up a word every now and then, um, but pretty quickly and um, think that I've got it. But I've started to realize that if I'm really going to listen carefully, I need to sit with that one page pretty much all day you know, for hours upon hours. Yeah, I take breaks and I go for walks and whatever, but to be able to sit with that one page and start to really listen to what's there, the verbs that are there, the chosen words that are there, and even the positions of words that are there, and start to wonder like, huh, wasn't that interesting? This verb is there, but usually when people are talking in the Hebrew stories, this verb is there, but this verb's there instead. Well, is that important? And I start to notice, huh, this, this word and this word, they kind of pun on each other. If I read the story out loud, I'm like, oh, it's kind of like our English rhymes in a sense, you know, that the sounds play on each other. And I'm like, oh, that might be significant. And that happens all the time in the ancient Hebrew. And most biblical translations, most Bibles that are translated from the Hebrew or the Greek, if it's the New Testament, into English, modern English, um, they miss a lot of that. They don't, they don't poke around as much. Um, they're not so interested in those puns, but the ancients certainly were. And as you'll soon see, I think, the story is much more interesting with a translation that begins to listen to um, 
those relationships within the story. As I've tried to do in my Naked Path of Prophet series, and in especially A Wildly Central Yahweh, which came out just a few months ago, um, actually just since December uh, of 2021, and in this translation of the Jay's stories of Genesis, it's most of Genesis right here, I try to begin to reveal these relationships in the verbs and the puns and draw people, uh, people's attention, readers' attention to the fact that these stories are way more clever than we give them credit for. Uh, they're perhaps the most clever stories ever told on the planet. Uh, imagine that, I'm not the first person to say such a thing. Uh, Harold Bloom said the same thing, uh, the famous uh, English lit scholar. So you begin to wonder like what we've missed all these generations, all these millennia about again, this idea of the equal value of human beings. So I'd like to invite you to hear this story again, maybe for the first time, get a little sip. And to begin to wonder, and if you'd like, you could, get out your own um, Bible, your own English translation, or if you're a Hebrew reader, get out your Hebrew Bible and really follow along at some of the clevernesses that are there in the text um, and begin to wonder what it is that this story might be offering us 3,000 years later, maybe an idea that we're finally ready for. On the day Yahweh of the God and goddesses made the solid ground and the solid sky, and as for all the wild shrubbery of the rolling field, well, it was before any of that was on the solid ground, and all the glistening gra grass of the rolling field, it was before any of that had sprung up, because Yahweh of the God and God and goddesses hadn't yet made rain fall on the solid ground, and there was no mud creature to slave away at the mud. Not, there's a pun right there in Hebrew. And a mist climbed up from the solid ground and gave a drink to everything on the mud's face. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses shaped the mud creature out of dust from the mud and puffed into its nose a blast of life. And the mud creature was a real live thing. Now, you got to know that in ancient tradition, Yahweh was the wind, was the breath. And here Yahweh is blowing a blast of life into this nose of this mud creature and... Up it comes from the ground. It's a real live thing on its own. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses planted an orchard in pleasure. That's the word that usually is translated as Eden. Eden means pleasure in Hebrew. Planted an orchard in pleasure in the east, and it placed there the mud creature it had shaped. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses made spring up the mud every tree that was lusty for looking and good for eating. And the living tree was in the middle of the orchard and the knowing good and bad tree. Now remember, an ancient person hearing the word knowing would think, is this about knowing things? Is this about knowing people intimately, sexually? Uh, it's meant to be kind of a, well, what, what's, what's this about? And Yahweh of the God and goddesses took the mud creature and left it alone in pleasure's orchard to slave away and protect it. And Yahweh, the God and goddesses, shouted out orders at the mud creature, saying, From every tree of the orchard you can eat, eat, eat. But from the knowing good and bad tree, you are not to eat from it, because on the day you eat from it, you'll die, die, die. And Yahweh, the God and goddesses, said, Not good being the mud creature all alone. I'm going to make for it a helper for its front, its talker, its complement. It's similar but different. Rather interesting, yeah. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses shaped from the mud every living thing of the rolling field and every bird of the solid sky. It brought each one to the mud creature to see what name it would call out for it. And for every one that the mud creature called out a name for it, each one, had a, each one was a real live thing. That was its name. And the mud creatures called out names for all the wild animals and all the birds of the solid sky and every living thing of the rolling field. But for mud creature, no one was found as a helper for its front, its talker, its complement, its similar but different. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses made a deep trance-like sleep fall on the mud creature, and it got all slack and slept, and, and it took one of its ribs, enough to make it limp later, that's a key little verb in the story, 
especially in the Genesis stories. It took out one of its ribs, enough to make it limp later, and it closed up the flesh underneath it. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses built up the rib that it had taken from the mud creature into a woman, and it brought her to the mud creature. And the mud creature said, this thrust, hmm, this beat, this time, bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. By the way, the word that is used there for flesh is often used for like penis flesh in the um, ancient Hebrew and throughout the Torah. And it's meant to be a pun there too. And this mud creature continues, flesh from my flesh. This one I call out the name woman because from her man, she took herself. You know, meant that, that's meant to be a total play, right? Usually men are born through women. Men and women are born through women. But here, <clears throat> the mud creature is saying, this one came from me. And so puns on man and her man and woman, all of those sound very similar in ancient Hebrew. And the two of them, the mud creature and his woman, were naked and sly, but they felt no shame. And the snake was the most naked and sly of all the living things of the rolling field that Yahweh the God and goddesses had made. This naked and sly, naked and sly repetition would be very clever in the ancient world too, another pun. Uh, often we get the mud creature and his woman were naked, they felt no shame, and snake was the most sly or clever, but it's the, actually it's the same word, the same, uh, same consonants. Uh, later tradition put in vowels that made it look very different from each other, but it's the same word, friends. It's meant to jar your imagination. And for those of us that are interested in the bigger messages of the Naked Path of Prophet, that naked and sly is pretty darn important in circles through the tradition, the prophetic tradition. And snake said to woman, so did, it, did the God and goddesses really say you're not to eat from every tree of the orchard? And woman said to snake, we can eat fruit from the trees of the orchard, but from fruit of the tree, which is the middle of the orchard, the god and goddesses says, do not eat from it and do not grab it or else you die. And snake said to woman, not die. You will not die. See, the god and goddesses know that on the day you all eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll all be like the god and goddesses in knowing good and bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that it was desirable to the eyes. And the tree was lusty, stirred up desire in her for insight, for understanding things. And she took from its fruit and ate it, and even gave some to her man there with her. And he ate. He's standing there the whole time, friends. And the eyes of the two of them, the eyes of the two of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked and sly. And they sewed together fig leaves and made for themselves girdles around their waists. And they heard the sound of Yahweh of the God and goddesses walking around in the orchard in the day's breeze. Yahweh, the wind, breath, right? And from within an orchard tree, the mud creature and his woman hid themselves and their lovemaking from the face of Yahweh of the God and goddesses. Now, this is key to the story. There are at least two kinds of hiding in ancient Hebrew. There's the kind of hiding like, oh, I'm going to hide behind that rock over there, satar. And there's the kind of hiding that, uh, which is here in the Eden story, the pleasure story, the pleasure story, um, the kind of hiding that is like hiding within someone, hiding within their arms, um, kaba in Hebrew. And um, scholars note, especially Strong's Concordance, the famous concordance, notes that, huh, isn't it interesting that this kind of hiding, kaba, is very similar to a form of the word for love or lovemaking, chaval. And um, what do you know? What do you think they're doing? They're, so I'll read that again. And from within an orchard tree, the mud creature and his woman hid themselves and their lovemaking from the face of Yahweh of the God and goddesses. And Yahweh of the God and goddesses called out to the mud creature and said to him, where are you? Hmm. This does not seem to be the all-knowing God, right? It's a story. It's meant to be funny, playful. 
And the mud creature said, your sound, like the wind, I guess. I heard it in the orchard. I was afraid because I was naked and sly and I hid myself, hid myself in love, in my lovemaking. And Yahweh said, who put forward, made it front and center? Remember, the woman is the front for the man, the mud creature. Who put forward, made it front and center to you that you're naked and sly? Why, from the tree, the one I shouted out orders at you, never to eat from it, you ate. The mud creature said, woman, the one you gave to be with me, she gave me something from the tree and I ate it, passing the buck, right? And Yahweh, the God and goddess, has said to woman, what's this? What did you do? And woman said, snake lent me a bad idea, so I ate. And Yahweh, the God and goddess, has said to snake, because you did this, bitterly cursed are you among all the wild animals and among all the living things of the rolling field. On your belly, you'll make your way. Dust you'll eat all the days of your life. And hatred, I put hatred between you and woman, between your seed, descendants, and her seed, descendants. They'll head snap and you'll heel snip. Another pun. It's a woman, it, Yahweh, said, multiply, multiply, multiply. That's how I'm making your labor worries and you're getting pregnant. In pain, you'll give birth to children. And towards your man, you'll overflow with thirst and desire. Actually, that word is quite punny because it also has to do with like legs as well. And he'll cleverly master and control you. And to the mud creature, it said, because you listened to your woman's voice and ate from the tree about which I shouted out orders at you saying, do not eat from it. Bitterly cursed is the mud because of you. In pain, you'll eat every day of your life. Thorn bushes and prickly plants will spring up for you and you'll eat glistening grass of the rolling field, which you know comes up today and dies tomorrow, gets burned out in the sun. By the sweat on your face, you'll eat bread until you return to the mud because you were taken from it because you are dust, and to dust, you'll return. And Yahweh, the goddesses, God and goddesses, made for the mud creature and his woman long-hanging skin shirts, and they wore them. So Yahweh gets over its uh, temper tantrum, right? And Yahweh, the God and goddesses, said, yikes, the mud creature is just like us in knowing good and bad. And now what if he reaches out his hand or penis, they're the same word in Hebrew, and takes something also from the living tree and eats and lives forever. And Yahweh, the God and goddess, has sent him out from pleasure's orchard to slave away at the mud from which he was taken. Yahweh drove out the mud creature like it was divorcing him. And to the east of pleasure's orchard, it made live there terrifying armed dudes who usually protected the solid sky and the flaming sword turning every direction to guard the way to the living tree. Now, the mud creature had intimately and sexually known his woman, wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth, and the story rolls on, right? The story rolls on. It's a wild, wild story, and something we don't usually uh, maybe slow down enough to notice, just the clevernesses that are there, and um, this the radical imagination that was there 3,000 years ago that's pointing to the fact during a time when, uh, at least in all the stories we've had, women were definitely below men. And here's this story, this storyteller around a campfire offering the story about a woman giving birth to knowing, to wisdom. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that fascinating? And that the snake was right. You know, we moderns tend to think that the snake is like the devil or something in the story, but the snake was right. In ancient tradition, snakes were seen as gods or god godly or divinities. And here the snake knew something. Maybe it had been nibbling at that apple or that fruit. We don't even know it's an apple, right? That piece of fruit. You know, in this new age emerging, could it be possible that we can begin to look back upon all our stories and notice where we've missed this idea uh, that keeps being born through, keeps being brought forward by, usually by prophets, you know, in our own times, you know, prophets like Martin Luther King and Dorothy Day and Gandhi and 
you know, many, 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 many others, just a short list there, um, you know, and then before them, you know, people who had just kept reminding people, ah, we're, we're made of the same stuff, we breathe the same air, um, and how much those folks have been pushed down, well, now, maybe there are more of us, right, maybe there are more of us that are, who are waking up to the possibility that we are made of the same stuff, breathing the same air, moving on this same planet together. And in this new age emerging, could we be playful to think that 3,000 years ago, a woman, the sweet lady Jay, sitting by a campfire, told a story where a woman was wiser than the wind, wiser than Yahweh, yeah? And outsmart and wiser than her own man, her own husband, right? Uh, and outsmarted them all through her curiosity and her lovemaking, you know, with her husband as she breathed life into mud creature, Adam. And he breathed life into her, that their lovemaking, their pants, their purrs with one another, just as Yahweh had uh, blasted life into the mud creature, here they were, this uh, man and this woman breathing life into each other, just as we all can breathe life into each other in our intimate relationships, certainly, but even more so in the wisdom that can begin to flow as we begin to pay attention together and wake up and know. Check us out, vitalitybuzz.org.